There we go. There you are. <laughs> I need to turn the video on. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. Greetings. 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 Um, and so we are um, uh, we have about uh, 25 attendants so far. We will, I think, Nikki, uh, we should go ahead and get started and at least with introductions, et cetera. Yes, I think we should go ahead and get started. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so I will start off this evening. I'm Woody Register. I teach history here at the University of the South, uh, and I'm also the director of the Roberson Project on Slavery, Race, and Reconciliation. So thank you all for joining us tonight, and especially a big thank you to our, our two guests, uh, our two uh, distinguished alums who are joining us here for this discussion this discussion tonight. So tonight's webinar poses the question of should universities that, are, that have, were founded by enslavers take up the question of re reparations? So it's universities in general that we're talking about here, you might say, but everyone I think who has come to this session tonight know that we're especially interested about one in university in particular, this university. Founded in the late 1850s to serve as the University of the South, which in the words of, uh, that is the University of the Plantation States, the slave states, uh, or the beloved land of the sun and the slave as the founding bishops, Episcopal bishops called this region's civilization of bondage. Uh, so we qualify, we, the University of the South, qualifies as one of those universities. Um, the persons pledging money to the inauguration of this institution were holding not hundreds and not thousands, but tens of thousands of people captive in slavery in the 1850s when they pledged their wealth uh, and their devotion to the founding of this university. So that's one part of the question. We, we qualify among those universities, but what about the question of reparations? Is that one that we, as one of these universities should take up? So in answering this question for myself, I have a number of influences, um, but I recall one in particular uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention tonight, Richard Cellini. Richard gave a talk here in September, 2019. He is the founder of the Georgetown Memory Project, uh, which is an organization that among other important things, uh, applied pressure on the university of that name to do more than just study its past, its own slave owning past. That is, uh, they pressured and successfully for Georgetown University to make reparations to the descendants of those people the Jesuits had enslaved in the early 19th century. Now, in, in his talk at Sewanee, Richard said that if you are truly a university, um, you cannot evade or ignore the question of reparations. He says, you cannot leave it unaddressed. You cannot leave it unanswered. You may decide after taking up the question to hand over everything you have. Uh, or you may decide to hand over nothing. Or you may decide to do, some, do something between those two extremes. But he said, you have to pursue and you have to answer the question because posing and debating and answering difficult questions is what universities do. But if we choose to do nothing, I mean, if we choose to do something, something that really matters, he said, 
It has to be more than public apologies. It has to be more than changing the names of buildings. It has to be more than changing the stories you tell to prospective students on campus tours. It has to be more than in, you know, changing, enriching the curriculum. He called that the arts and crafts school of reparations. It makes the headlines, but it doesn't make much difference. To do something that matters, he said, it will take wisdom, it will take courage, generosity, and grace, and we have to choose to do it. We have to do it because we want to do it. We have to choose something that matters instead of nothing. So tonight we are engaged, engaging in that questioning, and we have invited two of our alumni who have thought long and hard about this very question, and we ask them to share their experiences, to share their insights with us so that we as a university community can pursue the question of reparations and make a choice to do nothing or to do something that matters, uh, that makes a difference. Thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Register, for that introduction. Good evening and welcome everyone. I am Nikki Hamilton and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Government Affairs and Strategic Partnerships. I am delighted to be here tonight in conversation with our two Suwannee graduates, Jamoke Ifateo and David Johnson, to consider the question, as Dr. Register said, should universities founded by enslavers be talking about reparations? So before we begin, I want to give you a brief overview of how this conversation will be conducted. Uh, we have a few questions for our panelists and we'll allow them to respond. And then we will have an opportunity to open up the floor for, um, or open up the screen for our um, guests with us tonight. And if you would like to speak, you can uh, raise your hand or let us know in the Q&A and we will activate your mic. But in the meantime, please put all your questions in the Q&A and feel free to greet each other in the chat. Uh, so let me begin by introducing our panelists. So uh, Jamoke Efateo currently serves as the Southeast representative of NACOBRA, which is the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, the premier national reparation, reparations organization in the US. In addition, he serves as the male co-chair of the Atlanta chapter for NACOBRA and the facilitator of ASH committee of NACOBRA. He's the recent past chair, male co-chair of NACOBRA as well. Baba Jamoke, as how we call him, is a community activist, a lecturer, a thought leader, a visionary, a father, a spirit dancer, a consultant, and an entrepreneur. He has worked with various organizations, including, but not limited to ACORN, TransAfrica, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, Mississippi Action for Community Education, Nation of Islam, and the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Baba Jamoke serves on the Reparations Committee of the Movements for Black Lives and on the Education Committee of the National Reparations Summit. With over 20 years of experience with NACOBA and a lifetime of experience as a community activist, Jamoke has spoken at numerous schools, universities, conferences, and churches. Jamoke has written articles and done many interviews on reparations, on the reparations movement. In addition to hosting an annual six hour radio program on reparations, Jamoke also hosts a bi-weekly radio show and podcast on the Black Talk Radio Network called Conversations Reparations. Baba Jamoke received his BA from Suwannee, the University of the South, where he double majored in economics and third world studies. And our second panelist is David Johnson, and he's the first year Masters of Public Policy student and a Pearson Fellow at the Harrison School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. A native of Brownsville, Tennessee, he has explored transitional justice in Northern Ireland, in South Africa, in Germany, as well as Rwanda, 
as the Thomas J. Watson Fellow. During his Watson Fellowship, he worked with survivors, ex-prisoners, museum directors, state officials, activists, and professors around truth and reconciliation as it relates to conflict, slavery, genocide, apartheid, and dictator regimes. He's conducted more than 40 interviews and has visited more than 60 sites, which include memorials, museums, and monuments around each of these countries' past. Previously, he completed an internship with Baker McKenzie International Tax Group, the Transatlantic Leadership Initiative Department of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and the NAACP headquarters at the Du Bois Public Policy Fellow and the Nobel Peace Prize winning organization Grameen Bank in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He plans to pursue a career at the intersection of law and public policy, addressing transitional justice in African-American communities. Johnson graduated also from Sewanee University of the South in 2019 with a Bachelor's of Arts in Politics focusing on global institutions and a minor in economics. So welcome to you both, uh, David and Baba Jamoki. So we don't have a lot of time this evening. We have an hour, so I'm just gonna get straight to it. Um, so Baba Jamoki, you've worked with NACOBRA, which as we mentioned, is the National Coalition for Blacks for Reparations. Can you tell us what is the history of reparations and can you explain HR 40 and where we are today? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, I, I was laughing because I thought I had sent you all my short bio, not the long bio, but it's all good. <laughs> I was like, where'd you get that one from? Okay. Anyway, um, so first of all, I always like to begin by honoring the creator and our ancestors, and particularly those ancestors who fought in the reparations movement, people like Callie House and Queen Mother Moore, Dorothy Benton Lewis, and um, Imario Bedelli, Baba Hannibal Afrika, and many more. We, Nikki and I, we had talked about this before the show that, you know, do an orientation of the history of the race movement would be more than an hour <laughs> for me to really do it proper. So um, one, one story I thought would be interesting to share, though, <clears throat> because, you know, I, I've really studied the history of the race movement. And I tell people, you can give me any year from the ending of slavery until now, and I can tell you what organizational individuals were working on reparations. So that's a, it's a whole nother lecture by itself. But <clears throat> One story that I did want to share, I thought uh, relevant to our uh, neck of the woods, was is the story of Callie House. And Callie House was born in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, from what we understand, and she did most of her work in Nashville, Tennessee, which is right up the road, Murfreesboro, even closer to Nashville, right up the road from Sewanee. And so what she did was she organized something called the Ex-Slave Pension Fund Movement. And what this was, was she was looking at the fact that um, people who had fought in the war got pensions from the government. And you, if you think about it, you had formerly enslaved Africans who were so-called made free, but were, were made free without any type of resource. How were, they going, how were they going to survive? How were they going to live? How were they going to buy land? How would they do any of those kinds of things? And particularly if you think about those who were older, and that's what she was really concerned about, those who were older, who had already worked most of their lives and given most of their labor force to um, this country in the form of enslaved, just give them which, you know, if you think about like social security, something like that, she just said, just give them a little bit of something. I think even then it was like something like 15 cents a month, you know, just so they could have some bare minimum um, form of eco ec ec um, economics to survive during that time. And, and her movement really caught on. She enrolled over uh, 500,000 people. People sent money uh, to join her movement. Uh, she actually were able to get Congress people um, to put forward a bill to do this. It, it didn't um, succeed, but she was able to do that. And the other thing about Callie House, and there's so much more to tell, is a very good book written about her that you can um, get called My Face is Black is True um, by uh, Dr. Mary Frances Berry. But um, the last thing I just wanted to say, also one of the things that she did that people are not also aware of is that she also um, did a lawsuit for reparations. And there were some individual lawsuits that were successful and not successful, but she actually um, did, I think maybe the first um, like class action lawsuit for reparations in 1915. And so again, we really lift her up and her um, 
work that she's done in the reparations movement. So instead of giving the whole overview of the reparations movement, we'll give you one reparations story, um, historical story. Uh, in terms of, uh, and then you also asked me about HR 40. HR 40 and where we are yeah. today with that, yeah. Yeah, so that that one, I uh, will we'll address that as well. So HR 40, <clears throat> So HR 40 base was introduced in 1989 by Congressman Conyers. The backdrop to that is important though. What during that time is when the Japanese were getting reparations for their time spent in internment camps. During World War II, the United States government rounded up people of Japanese ancestry and put them in internment camps uh, out in the desert in Arizona and New Mexico and different places. And um, so this, they they felt that this was they were wrong. This and this needed to be redressed. And they and they fought and and they were successful. They passed a bill that made recommendations to Congress for them to get redressed. They got twenty thousand dollars apiece. The people who survived the internment camps, as well as their descendants, as well as they got um, a formal apology from then President Ronald Reagan and the United States government, as well as one of the things that people also don't know is they got freedom for their political prisoners. These are people who were who fought against the internment camps. Just like now we have freedom fighters right now who are still in jail from some of the 60s. That's a whole nother conversation as well. But um, so that was that was some of what they got. So African Americans were looking at the Japanese and say, wait a minute, what about our reparations? And so you had organizations and groups um, who had talked about reparations, but now were re-energized by this Japanese movement. So what was actually happened is that this, this, that was around the same time that INCOBRA came into existence in 1988. So the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations of America, a call was put out by Mario Bedelli, Queen Mother Dorothy Benton Lewis, to bring different organizations together who were concerned about reparations, but also to kind of and also though many of these groups were black nationalist groups and the thought was that we wanted to expand it beyond the black nationalist front and so they made a more broad based appeal to other organizations as well and so Conyers who was um, a congressman out of Detroit in another story <laughs> uh, reparations Ray Jenkins uh, who had been a long time advocate for reparations in Detroit had been encouraging um, kind of to do something around reparations. So you have, so now with the Japanese getting reparations and with, with Cobra coming to existence, he's now convinced to go ahead and put forward a bill for reparations. And he used, he used a model of how the Japanese got reparations, which was a study commission. So he wrote the language, basically just switched out the Japanese section, put, uh, put us in and said, you know, this is a bill that Congress should consider. He reintroduced that bill every year from 1989 until he had to leave Congress. He passed the bill on to Sheila Jackson Lee, who picked up the bill, I believe, in 2017. But also right around that time, um, it's important to note that that, there, that many activists were feeling a little um, not so happy with, with HR 40, and we felt like it needed to be, uh, it wasn't strong enough because it was only calling for a, a study commission. And we feel like, there was so much going on at that time that really already affirmed that we deserve reparations, like the United Nations calling for us to have reparations. So the bill was um, a group, um, uh, another organization called the National African American Reparations Commission, known as NARC, along with NCOBRA, made some suggestions to Conyers of how to edit the bill, to make it a stronger bill, to have the bill actually call for reparations proposals and to add international language to the bill that makes it in alignment with the United Nations definition of reparations, which I'll give a little later, but that's very important. And it, it called that that was also included into the bill. And so since then, the um, Sheila Jackson Lee has been really very aggressive at promoting the bill. And so we, we're very excited. She's, she's pushed us and we've pushed her. And, and so um, normally the bill each year gets around 30 to 40 co-sponsors. Last year in the last cycle, we, were, we got it up to 173 co-sponsors. That's unheard of. When you bring a bill to the floor with 173 co-sponsors, it pretty much is guaranteed to pass. There's only it takes 212 votes for it to pass in Congress at the House level. Now there's a Senate level, that's a whole nother conversation. And then signed by president, that's another conversation. So unfortunately though, the, the, just bringing this to a close. So the congressional cycle is two years. So the last cycle just ended in 2020. It was, it was it, the movement that we had those 173. So then we had to start all over again. And in 2021 to 
to get those, um, to get as many of those Congress people to sign on board again, this time as original co-sponsors. And as well as now we're up to 167. So we got almost all of them on board again. And, you know, some, there's been some shakeup, some, some of them are not, you know, in office now. And so we're working still to get more Congress people on board. Um, just final two notes, there was a, a um, hearing. A hearing is very important because the hearing sets a precedent for um, giving what's called legitimacy to a bill. It, a hearing is done in Congress, and supposedly the, the rationale is to say, demonstrate to us that this bill is good for all of America. It's somewhat the rationale for hearing. So you have a hearing, there was one in 2019 with Danny Glover and Tana Hasi Coates and some other people testified and had a big turnout. Uh, they had to it fill three rooms, three overflow rooms. I was in one of those overflow rooms, couldn't get into the main room. But anyway, um, and then there was another hearing just this year, February 17th. And, uh, and so now the next step is what's called a markup, where they, they fine tune the bill and then it goes to the floor of Congress. And this will be the first time we feel we are confident that this bill will actually get out of committee, go to the floor of Congress in this, this session in 2021. So that's the for the update. I hope I left some time for David. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And great historical perspective. We appreciate that. Uh, so David, I'll now turn to you and perhaps you can share some insights from your Watson experience studying transitional justice. And uh, maybe you can define trans transitional justice for the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you, Nikki and Woody and the Robertson Project for having me. Bubba Jamoke, it's an honor to be on this panel with you. Um, I really couldn't believe that there was a Swanee grad graduate who was also um, an NCOBRA representative. I, I had to see it for me to believe it. So um, <laughs> thank you for being here and for all the work that you do. Um, but as far as insights that I got from my Watson, I think I had two major takeaways um, from that experience. And it got cut short. I, I ended um, probably eight months into my project instead of the full year. And I was leaving South Africa at the time. And uh, the first takeaway, well, before I get into that, um, transitional justice, which was the topic I was exploring as a Watson Fellow, is, is an international um, norm that's used for, for countries when addressing past abuses or past regimes. So, for example, this is what Germany did um, after the Holocaust. This is what South Africa did after apartheid. This is what Chile did after the um, uh, Pinochet regime. Um, they use different norms such as truth commissions, lustrations, uh, vetting processes, reparations, uh, memorials to pretty much unify the country and repair past harms that have left large disparities in, in those oppressed communities. Um, so the first takeaway I got from, from um, this project was kind of how bad we had it in the United States. And, uh, you know, gr growing up and being a, um, you know, Black American, you know, I've known the, the crimes that have been perpetrated against my community. So it wasn't necessarily anything new to, to have that in my mind. But to have people, um, you know, people in Germany, people in Poland, people in South Africa say, yeah, you know, this is really bad. You know, something, something should be done about this. It kind of made me um, almost ashamed of my, my American nationality. Um, and I understood the privileges that I had with an American passport, with US dollars in my pocket traveling to these different countries. Um, but to understand the disrespect that was perpetrated against, you know, Black Americans for centuries um, really took a toll on my uh, mental health when I was doing this trip. And I'll tell one story about um, kind of the sadness that I felt in those moments. So I visited uh, Auschwitz back in 2019. And for those of you who don't know, Auschwitz is a concentration camp um, where over a million Jews were persecuted uh, during the Holocaust. And um, I went there just to visit the, the former concentration camp and to talk with um, department heads about how they transformed the space um, after its liberation in 1945. And um, there was a final question that I asked in the interview um, that kind of just left everybody in silence um, after our discussion. And I asked them, um, you know, could you ever imagine someone coming to a concentration camp um, and having a celebration, you know? having a graduation, having a party, a wedding, some sort of shindig, having fun. Um, could you imagine that on, on these grounds? And of course, that made everybody quiet and they were looking around like, who is this crazy, you know, American coming in here asking a question such as that? And of course they said, no, you know, nobody would ever think to even have some sort of 
celebratory event on these grounds because of the education that they have about what happened here. And uh, just the, the general atonement that Europe has had about the Holocaust and what has happened um, to Jewish people. So they asked in response, you know, what, what made you ask that question? And I said in response, well, in the United States, uh, people still have weddings and celebratory events on plantations where my ancestors toiled as, as chattel. Uh, they still have these events and, and act as though that our pain and our suffering and what we did on those plantations didn't matter. It's this sense of, of denial to them to the point where it doesn't really matter the feelings of the oppressed community as long as they're getting their satisfaction. And when they heard that, they kind of started to laugh and not at the comparison that I made, but at the utter disrespect that the United States had towards its own citizens, citizens that have fought in every war that it's been in, citizens that have constantly um, you know, made this democracy stronger with its activism. So after that, I, I really saw the differences between the United States and other countries, not in our sins and not in our past crimes, because other countries have been involved with the slave trade. Other countries have created apartheid states. Other countries have expropriated land from indigenous people. We're one of the only countries who continue to deny that past and deny the disparities that it's created. The second takeaway that I think I got from my Watson um, was this topic of reconciliation. And there really is no reconciliation without reparations. Right. And especially when you're, you're, you're transitioning from a period of oppression that has created disparities like slavery, like apartheid, where people are being taxed, where people are being stolen from, there really isn't any reconciliation or unification without reparations, without that monetary compensation, without that wealth redistribution. I think that's perfectly evidenced in South Africa today. Um, when you look at South Africa, it's a champion for democracy, it's a champion for truth and reconciliation. You have these figures like Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, you know, winning Nobel Peace Prizes. And you know, this is just a topic where the country that's studied in, in a lot of classes, specifically when I was a swine, this was studied and kind of um, inspired my project. It's supposed to be like this, this hallmark of reconciliation and transitional justice. So I'm thinking when I get to South Africa, like, oh, I'm going to get here and everything is going to be great. Um, you know, the Black people are going to be living well. It's going to be a unified country. They're going to be able to talk about um, what happened in a, in a unifying manner. Everything's just going to be good. And as soon as I get there, as I'm, I'm leaving the airport, I see these townships. And I'm just thinking, like, these still exist. You know, people are still living on top of each other with, you know, no power, no and uh, no access to like electricity or internet or food. And then I started to look at the statistics. I found that, you know, up to 90% of the population that is predominantly black and colored only owns 10% of the wealth. 10% of the population that's predominantly white owns 90% of the wealth. And even within that majority of the population, they only own up to maybe four or 5% of the land. How does that happen in a reconciled nation? So when you think about, you know, reconciliation and healing, and all these buzzwords that people are using today, if they're gonna really talk about reconciliation and what that means for an oppressed community, if that uh, period has created a disparity, such as an apartheid, something that the American um, government has created, something like slavery, something that the American government is also guilty of, you can't really have a conversation about reconciliation or unification without reparations, without that compensation to redress that harm and that both yeah. yeah thank you for that powerful testimony um david and if you don't know i'm from johannesburg south africa so i know exactly what you're talking about from the april to alexander um and it is a stark ju juxtaposition of the two sides of the highway so um but i want to bring our conversation back and um talk about universities so for people working in reparations and restorative and trans um, national justice movements, what role do you all see universities playing, especially those with histories in slavery? And anybody can get, yeah. Go ahead, Baba Chum, okay. Okay, <clears throat> well, there, there are several things I think that we, we should consider. Well, first of all, it's important to not just limit um, reparations based on slavery. So let me just make that clear. Um, for me, uh, reparations is based on 
you know, harms that have, were done from the enslavement period, but continue into the Jim Crow period, convict leasing period, continue into even up to this conversation we're having now that still haven't been addressed and rectified and, and, will, and will continue until we get reparations. So reparations is, is beyond just slavery. So even, you know, we, um, so that's important to, to make that distinction. Um, and, and then so, Wow, what, what needs to be done? And, and see, this is the part of the area that we have really not done a lot of work on. And, and I, I always kind of apologize for or COBRA and other organizations that, that really think through what, what would it actually begin to look like. Uh, I did begin to write down some ideas of some things that I thought that would be important. Um, you know, and I don't know, that's where we want to get into some specifics now. Is that... Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Let's get into the meat of it. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, well, one thing I, is that I think it's a very important that we 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 that universities have a have a role in educating uh, the citizens. Right. That's that's what they that's what they do. Right. And I was I actually I went and just Google today and saw you know like how many United States presidents with United States president hadn't gone to college. There's only one that hadn't gone to college, right? That's um, George Washington. All the rest of them attended college, right? So, you know, Sewanee has, uh, you know, his role in, in producing um, congressmen and senators and governors and elected officials who are gonna impact society. They also have produced, you know, business leaders and other types of people that, and, that shape public policy as well. So I think that it's very important that we, that we, that part of the reparations that universities can do is around educating people around the issue of racism, systemic racism, and reparations. Like I think that you know, putting together uh, think tanks and forums like this and other types of forums and including it into the curriculum. You know, like I was reading the um, the document that was put together for for the Robinson Research Project. Like, what if every Swanee student had to read that? You know, like I'm walking around, going to these dorms, not knowing who Elliot was, not knowing who Manigault was, not knowing who these people are going to these different buildings on campus and stuff. And that was like a really profound piece to me to read, like who these people were, what they did, how they contributed to Suwani. You know, even though they, con they contributed financially, they contributed their ideas and all of that, but they also contributed that wealth based on enslavement. You know, and even just the whole racism that perpetuated even the, the mindset of the superior white man and all of that, you know. So I think that, that that story should be known by everybody. Like, I don't know if that's, I just thought that was really a great piece with it. And I think that also it should be updated, you know, kind of dropped off in the 70s. So I think we should make it current. Let's talk to some alumni. Um, you know, who went to Swanee in the 70s, Black alumni went to Swanee in the 70s and in the 80s, which is my period, and in the 90s and coming up to the present. And so that, that we would, you could have a whole history of Swanee from 1850s all the way up to current, you know, um, and, and how African-American students have uh, adjusted to Sewanee and, and, and made their contributions to Sewanee. Um, one of the things that I, I, I said that um, I, I shared this story with Clark and, and actually with Nikki as well, which is I was a little uh, disappointed and that's putting it nicely, I guess. I was a little disappointed when I went to the, the multicultural center uh, and, and, and the status of the multicultural center in terms of the, it, the furniture and different things were in disrepair. And you know, and this is a visit I made years ago, maybe 10, 15 years, more than 10 years, 15 years ago. And when I mentioned it to Clark, she was like, it's still like that. I was like, no, you're kidding me. <laughs> so, um, so I think some investment in, 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 in the student center that or the center that was set up for African-American students to feel home, to feel, you know, where they can come together and congregate, like there should be some more investment in that specific place that, yes, as we make it personal, I don't know if we're supposed to be answering personal for Sawani or, or, or Universities in general. I think you were talking about universities yeah, in general. Both too. I, I'll, I'll stop there, yeah. and 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 I have some more thoughts on it, but I'll stop there and, and let David come on in. <laughs> Thanks, David. Yeah, uh, I can say this is something I had a problem with as a student at at Swanee and, and being engaged with the Robeson Project because I really didn't know what we were supposed to do, um, at least as students, and then as members of. Um, the project past, just like the historical research and analysis of it. And, um, you know, as like a junior and senior in college, like, I, I just thought like, oh, we got to rip all the names down off the, 
off the dorms and the libraries and the, the dining hall. That's where the real change is coming from. Um, I don't want to look up and see Confederate generals and slaveholders um, as I'm walking into these buildings. Um, but as I'm looking back at it now, um, you know, it's great that those things can be removed and replaced with people um, who are on the better side of history. Um, but it really doesn't do much in terms of um, like repair and and that wealth gap that we're talking about that the university um, benefited from. Of course, it's a, it's a symbolic form of repair and, and acknowledging um, why those people were put up on, on um, buildings and the memorials that we have on campus. Um, but that shouldn't absolve the university from, you know, other forms of repair that it can be involved with. Um, a second thing I want to note is that the topic of reparations shouldn't be included in any university's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, that's something you should already be doing as a university. Like the, the, the country is becoming more diverse and diverse by the day. Soon it'll be a majority minority uh, country within the next few decades. Like, um, yeah, reparations shouldn't even be in that conversation because reparations um, have that intentionality of addressing a specific harm against a specific people. But the role I think that universities can play now on top of all the great things that I think the Robeson Project is doing and the evidence that you all have displayed, which I think is incredible. I, I, I think I read through it once a month um, just because I'm just like, wow, um, we were really entangled with this wretched practice. Um, but on top of, I guess, the, the education that you all are doing right now and the ways that you're connecting with um, different groups across the country who are doing the same work, I think first you should connect with um, the descendants of the enslaved who the university is connected to, um, specifically with founders who were engaged with the slave practice or, or the slave holding practice. So, for example, um, Leonidas Polk and his plantation. Can you connect um, descendants of that plantation um, from his plantation to Swanee and see if those people are still around in that same area? You know, getting uh, insight from Black alumni, you know, who were here, not just when I was there, but like in the 80s and the 90s and the 70s, hearing their stories and seeing what exactly they can do. Because any form of repair that the university tries to make will always fail if it doesn't get that insight from those two groups. Um, because then you're just doing something for your own good. And you're not asking actually the communities that, that suffered under those um, crimes. But I guess on top of those things and um, the general education, just continuing to, um, or, or just past those, those specific things, advocating for HR 40, advocating behind the INCOBRAs um, and the other reparations groups in, in line with what they're saying um, to make sure that this bill can actually get passed. I, I think it'll be, um, I, and Derry says this in his From Here to Equality book, it'll be much more meaningful um, for Swanee or other universities with those entanglements with slavery and apartheid, um, more meaningful than um, them doing their own form of reparations to the descendants of the enslaved that they're connected to, if they actually went on a national front, like they've done, you know, with, um, you know, saying that they're disassociating with their past of, you know, the, Confed the Confederacy or um, addressing its past with enslavement. What would be more meaningful is calling for reparations on a national scale, because at the end of the day, um, the wealth that was garnered from slavery that helped build Swanee wouldn't have happened if slavery was illegal in the United States. And because of that, the, the fault doesn't necessarily fall on Swanee, it falls on the Uni United States government. And because of that, the focus should be put on them, ultimately, always, and, and not just on universities. Great, David, and that brings up a point of um, two scholars, Sandy Darity and uh, Kirsten Mullen, um, in their new book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. So one of the things they argue there is uh, exactly what you're saying is that, you know, they feel that repar university reparations might be too small. And like one of the examples they give is right, Georgetown saying they're gonna set aside a fund for 400,000 and they did the math. If you divide that by 12,000 descendants, that's $37 per person. So they argue that there really needs to be a focused and holistic national reparations program. And if you're trying to think about the wealth gap and how do you create generational wealth 
then those reparations, they're right, are not sufficient. So Baba Jamoki, I know you have a lot to say about this. So can you respond to um, that argument? Sure. Um, well, there's several things. First of all, I think we, we look at it from in COVID from the perspective that it doesn't have to be either or. We say that people can fight for reparations and get different types of reparations, um, concessions or successes, wins, whatever we want to call them, at different levels, whether it's at the university level, whether it's at the city level, state level, uh, corporation level, or family level. And so we feel like all of those are important. We're, what we're working really on, is, in my opinion, is creating a reparations culture, reparations climate. And reason why, and, and, um, and another reason why that's important is because that helps to build the momentum for it to pass at the national level. And when we look at, for example, um, Martin Luther King's birthday, it was passed first at, local, at cities and states and corporations passed resolutions and it built up a momentum such that it got passed at the federal level. If we look at, for example, what's happening now with legalization of marijuana and, and things like that, those, those legislation like that has passed a $15 minimum wage, right? Those things have passed at city level, state level, and different things like that. And that built up a momentum to now it's happening at the national level. They're considering, you know, legalizing marijuana national level, considering even as we talk $15 minimum wage, right? When you have cities and states that have passed that already. And so that momentum, I feel it, it contributes to us winning at the national level, winning you know, quicker at the national level when local um, people do it. Of course, a city or a state or a college can't fulfill what reparations has to be. That's obvious, right? But it's not, we don't see it as either or, we see it as complementary working together. So Suwannee is owned by the Episcopal Church and um, you know they've had a lot to say about reparations. So what role do you think the church should be playing in um, this conversation? And I'll go to you again, um, Baba Jamaki, because I know this is something that you have looked into and researched. And sure. then I'll go to you, David. Sure. Well, <clears throat> like I mentioned, there was a there was a hearing for HR 40 in 2019 and again in 2021, uh, just a few weeks ago. But there was also another hearing. I, I was trying to look up the date, but uh, I, I'll get that. That's when I come back and do the fuller presentation, right, Dr. Woody? <laughs> but uh, when um, there was another, um, there was another hearing. And at that hearing, the, 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 I don't know the, the actual title, but the, the, lead, the leadership of the Episcopal Church actually testified at that hearing. At the 2019 hearing, you had the leader of the Maryland Diocese, the Episcopal Diocese that testified at that hearing. And so the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church, I guess in, in England has also spoken in support of reparations. And so right now there's a New York Diocese Reparations Committee and there's several other states that are, are doing things around reparations at, through the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church has uh, just recently, the Maryland Diocese just put up a reparations fund, put some money into it, not just talking about reparations, as well as the, a specific church within the Maryland Diocese has added an additional amount of money to that fund and has challenged other uh, Episcopal churches and groups to support that, their fund. So yes, I think that you know the Episcopal Church and again, going back to what David said, I think that you know it, it would be important for them to do what they do at their local level, at their church level, at, their church, at the Episcopal Church level, but also we want them to also be advocates for HR 40 and to, to push this idea at, at, at the national level as well. David, would you like to respond about the church or? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I agree with, with everything that's been said. And I, I think that churches are just as culpable um, as universities, as any corporation in the United States um, for their role in, in um, slavery and its preservation. When you think about um, African-Americans association with um, Christianity, it kind of comes from that. And um, to a certain extent, Christianity was used to further enslave um, African Americans, or at least to to make slavery not sound as bad because it was written in the Bible. Um, 
So when you look at with, with those things, you can't really um, separate the two. As, as good as you want to sound, as, as godly as you want to sound, we have to look at the flaws within um, the teachings of Christianity and what that does to uh, people. So yeah, I, I would think that um, those institutions are definitely not off the table when it comes to uh, reparations. So what do you say to people um, that have the mindset that, you know, this was a long time ago, this is not my responsibility, I'm not my ancestors, what does this have to do with me? Why can't we just move forward? Like, what do you say to people with that mindset? Um, Dave, yeah, so it's a funny um, question, but I... The last person I think who was enslaved in the United States died in 1935. Um, and then back to what Brother Jamoki was saying, um, this isn't also, when we talk about reparations, it's not only for chattel slavery, it's also for apartheid. That was theft in itself as well. Um, and there are a plethora of people who are still alive that uh, you know, lived under apartheid. My parents, my grandparents, you know, we, I grew up in a town that mirrored Cape Town and in it being um, a minority rural society with a white minority. Um, so those people are very alive and well um, and understanding of what that shared experience is um, in the United States. And um, just because, I guess, a debt hasn't been paid yet, and it's kind of getting to the point where it's like, oh, these people may die, they may die off, and they may not be able to reap those benefits, like people say in, in counter arguments, reparations, oh, all enslaved people are dead now. Um, just because the debt wasn't paid back then doesn't absolve that, the government from paying the debt now. If, if anything, the, the descendants of the enslaved should be entitled to those benefits, seeing the large disparity that slavery has created, that Jim Crow segregation has uh, created. So when you look at those statistics and you look at all of the race neutral policies that have been passed that really haven't done much to end those racial wealth gaps, the only thing you can look at next is reparations. And for someone to say, um, you know, it shouldn't go to the descendants of, of the enslaved or it should only be for direct descendants of that stuff, it's just a total, um, they're trying to absolve themselves from that crime because of this, um, I guess, addiction or fascination with denial we have in this country. Yeah. And you're right, even though slavery ended a long time ago, its legacies are still being manifested, right, in modern times, as you mentioned, Jim Crow and redlining. And now with COVID, right, it's a, it's illuminated uh, the health and economic disparities. But sorry, go ahead, um, Baba Jim, okay? Well, yeah, I just want to disagree with what David was saying. But the other point is there's the deficits, but then there's also the benefits, right? So we also have to talk about the fact that you know, the, those folks who benefited from the enslavement period and benefited from Jim Crow li live on that wealth now, benefit from that wealth now, right? Benefit from those laws that, that were in place so that their family could benefit, you know, benefit from um, lynching Black people who were successful in business, whatever. And so those, the, the, the benefits that, that they have accrued, but they, they don't want to acknowledge that or they don't want, you know, they don't want to acknowledge that, but they want to acknowledge something, the, they don't want to acknowledge the crime, but they also have to then also acknowledge the, the current benefits that they, that they uh, live off of, you know, as a result of what happened and continues to happen today, even, you know, even today. So I, I know we're getting to the time where we need to include the audience. So audience, please go ahead and add your questions in the Q&A and we'll answer that. Um, but I do wanna bring you all back to this question um, about Suwani. And so Ta-Nehisi Coates in his 2014 article, The Case for Reparations, I think everybody has read it by now. And if you haven't, I encourage you to read it. Um, you know, said that reparations would impel a national reckoning that would lead to a spiritual renewal. We now have an acknowledgement from the university about its roots in slavery and its long support of white supremacy. Um, in thinking about those connections between restorative justice or translational um, justice and reparations and considering the case of Swanee, 
what obligation does Suwani have to address the harm done? I can, yeah, I, I can go first. Um, I was actually in a, um, we got into a heated debate, me and a, a, another Suwani alumni um, about, I guess, our interpretation of uh, what the South meant to us. And I was telling her, um, you know, I, I just never see the South disassociating with its relationship with the Confederacy. It'll always be known as that no matter, um, you know, what we do, what progressive movements we lead out of this region, there will always be this weird um, fascination with, uh, you know, the lost cause and the Confederacy. And she disagreed. She said that, you know, if the right people got behind it and, you know, got in these different leadership roles, and, and continue to push the movement forward, uh, not only around reparations, but just generally in, in activism that a new interpretation could emerge about what the South means to the United States and to the world. And um, I think the university with its name being the University of the South uh, mm -hmm. definitely started a new chapter um, when it um, you know, said the words that it said last year about its relationship with the Confederacy and its ties to slavery. That had never been done before. I remember when I was on campus, it was it was like pulling teeth for them to even associate with themselves, associate themselves with the Confederacy. Um, so now that you said those things about the Confederacy and your relationship, about slavery and its ties to your founding, um, there's really no turning back now. You have to um, be in align with these these movements that you say you admire, that you understand. Um, you have to be on the front lines for those communities that are students at your schools. And most importantly, if the student body and the alumni and the um, communities that you benefited from, you know, historically are calling for these things like reparations, um, like addressing the past with, past with memorials and, and different institution building, that is your obligation to get behind them and provide your resources, wealth, um, anything that you have been able to build off the shoulders and the sweat of those people, you owe it to them to, to help them and to aid with them um, to make sure that those things can come into fruition. And then after that, you know, the University of the South will take a totally new meaning um, and not mean what it meant um, decades ago or even what it means, um, you know, most recently. Thank you for that, David. And Baba Jamoke, I know you want to respond to that. So I'll let you go ahead. And then we have a question in the Q&A that we'll go to. I, I didn't really have anything to add to that. Uh, just the just point that I want, I'll go back to what David said at the very beginning, which is um, the only way to reconciliation is through reparation. And before we go to this question, I mean, David, you studied restorative justice, right? And so the idea of a restorative justice is that the perpetrator and the victim has to be in conversation with each other so that you can ask for forgiveness, right? And then there's this idea that we're gonna move to um, reparations, but that's not possible in this case, right? Of the US, because most of the folks have um, died. So how do you how do you how do you go about making the argument for restorative justice in the U.S.? No, well, it, it, that opportunity hasn't passed for sure because the descendants of those people who um, endured those crimes are still living with those legacies today. Like I still feel for that for my ancestors, um, specifically when my grandmother tells me a story about the crimes she witnessed growing up in Brownsville, Tennessee, or her ancestors that were enslaved. Like I feel that today and I understand the disparities that that has created. Um, so we still can enter into those types of restorative justice relationships. And like I said before, that is the only type of relationship that can get real reconciliation because you're not just giving me something and then you know throwing it under the rug. This isn't just like hush money to keep me quiet and say, hey, we gave you this, you know, now you can go about your day. This is an actual relationship that we're amending. Um, and this is what actually makes democracy stronger. This is what makes our institutions stronger. When you have all of your citizens on one accord because they trust those institutions again. Black Americans do not trust you know, these institutions because of the violence that they've 
perpetrated against us for centuries. You know, it has to be that type of relationship of amending it. It can't just be like a singular payment with no acknowledgement and, you know, totally doing the 360 on how we look at our curriculum, look at our education, look at memorials around our country. It has to be that type of relationship where we enter into negotiations and have those discussions about what the government owes to the African American community and how that can be amended, what can be accepted, and how we can actually move forward as a unified uh, country. Thanks. Well, we're going to take this question in um, the Q&A. So Charles Whitman is wondering about the panelists' thoughts on the idea of the responsibility of reparations for the descendants of the early Black residents of Suwannee. Yeah, so I, I listened to the uh, webinar that was done a few weeks ago where uh, some of the uh, residents of the Sw of Suwannee were, were lifted up and, and told some of their stories and um, were, were, you know, and I think that was very, very good. I, I also understood that toward the end that there was a, a plan to put up some markers around to, to tell their story. Um, I didn't realize it like there's hardly none of them living in, in Solani now. There was some when I was there. Um, and again, I think, you know, but, you know, again, I think more, more significant things need to be done. Like, you know, I don't, and I don't know what that would look like necessarily. Like I said, maybe, it, you know, Swanee needs to, you know, take a little of that endowment money and set up some kind of uh, trust for, for, for some of their descendants to, to be able to go to Swanee or to, to start their own business. Or they may, you know, we have to, you know, have some conversations with them about what, what are some ways that they feel like they might like to be economically empowered around that. Um, you know, um, having, you know, once lived in Sawani and no longer living there in Sawani for various reasons, but um, yeah. So the answer, the short answer to the question, yes. <laughs> what about you, David? Yeah, um, I, I think this question hits on a, a lot of the things that we've already um, discussed, but I think the most meaningful thing that can be done is also with those early graduates of Swanee um, and all black graduates of Swanee, at least those that have descended from the enslaved in America, um, putting us all in a room together and, and, us, and us just talking all of this out about what we would actually want from Swanee. And you know, this can be a model for other universities to have that relationship with not only the black community um, that the university may encompass, but also the black um, students and graduates at the university to come together and actually talk this out and be able to come to the institution with something that they actually want. Um, because again, you know, if you give something that was not asked for, it'll always miss uh, what the reparation was supposed to be. I, I had that very same idea. I was thinking about um, having calling the Black alumni together to meet. I, I, I just thought in my mind, maybe twice, twice, a, uh, twice a year, um, and along with the current uh, students, right? And because particularly that make sure that alumni was central to it because what happened is like say uh, you might have a college senior right who come up with some good idea but then they leave campus right so there's no there's no formation that'll keep that idea alive or, or, or even if some ideas are, are implemented you would still want some group to make sure that it continues to get implemented every year right right well so I know I, I had the very okay. same idea that you know, we, we should create some type of, uh, and, it, and it, include, um, it could include residents as well, former residents of Sawani as well. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, finish your sentence. I was just gonna go to the next question, but I want you to finish your sentence. No, that was it. I was just saying, I, I had a very similar idea and I, I think that that would be um, something that would be really helpful in this process for the Robinson Project. Great, so, um, Judith Mocklin, thanks for your question. And Judith is saying, how would individuals practice restorative justice with the mentioned focus of apologizing and being in conversation and offer reparation? Are we speaking kind of generally or like the relationship between universities and its black um, communities and its black alumni? I think this sounds like a general question. So how individuals practice restorative justice, um, yeah, and offer repar reparations. So this is more about individuals. 
Yeah, um, this is restorative justice is kind of used as an alternative to traditional criminal justice mechanisms uh, globally. Um, so like before getting to that process where people are imprisoned or prosecuted, they offer this alternative where the perpetrator can come forward, acknowledge their wrongdoing um, and ask for forgiveness. And if the victim is okay with that, then they can move on, amend that relationship and move forward. Um, so I guess in this example, um, from an individual case, it would look like, um, you know, a slave holding family um, who garnered a plethora of wealth from, from that practice, paying reparations or first acknowledging their wrongdoing, um, addressing that and trying to amend that relationship with the descendants of those who were enslaved on that plantation, offering reparations or first um, asking what they would want in, in a form of reparation to try to mend that relationship, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so, you know, well, David, you know, Bishop Tutu says there's no future without forgiveness, but in order to give forgiveness, somebody has to ask it. And so, you know, how do you, how do you balance that? Because that's an important aspect of restorative justice is asking for forgiveness. Yeah, there is no forgiveness without, uh, well, at least for me, I don't think there's any forgiveness without accountability. And I think of the events that just happened on January 6th with, you know, those domestic terrorists storming the Capitol. And immediately after um, it was kind of taken down, um, you had these senators and these congressmen talking about healing and, oh, we just need to move past this. We need to heal. We need to unify the country. And it's like, no, that this what what happened that day has been happening you know throughout the united states for centuries with you know white domestic terrorists bombing black neighborhoods or white militias overthrowing governments that were multiracial um this has been us for a long time and if we don't hold each other accountable especially those who keep terrorizing communities how can we adequately forgive and this talk this conversation about reparations and people saying oh it's it's past now, um, you know, the people that would be entitled to reparations um, are dead. Like we keep talking about this because it's still owed. There has not been anything of this sort that has been given to black people. It wasn't affirmative action. We were excluded from the majority of, of um, social welfare benefits that have been happening throughout the 20th century. Um, for example, like the GI benefits that weren't given to black soldiers coming home from the war. Uh, we can't just continue to let these things go by and then act like you want Black Americans to be patriotic and be passionate about their country. We can't forgive a people who don't want to be forgiven or can't even hold themselves accountable. Yeah, thanks. And I'm gonna move along to this question because I know we're coming to the end of our time and uh, this might be our last question. So how can universities practice restorative justice through policy? And that's from Helen. Baba Jamoki, you want to take that? I thought that was a David question. He's the restorative justice guy. <laughs> I see. Um, I see. I, I have studied a little bit of restorative justice. So, um, you know, we, we, I feel like we kind of been, been, been discussing it all along. You know, you know, what is, there has, there has to be, let, let, can I, let me let me let me share this story. It's, I, I heard this story from one of my elders about how um, there was a, a, a young man who. Um, no, let me not share that story. <laughs> it's not really relevant. Make the point. So yeah, we, we we have to figure out a way to to bring um, people together who have benefited. Um, from white supremacy, I don't even like to use that term, uh, um, and who, um, with those who who have been a uh, victim of that philosophy and, and belief, in in a way that is respectful, that has dignity, and in a way that there is some um, tangible outcomes more than just a conversation, right? that there's some very tangible outcomes that people feel um, that the people who are victims say, this is what we want, this is what we need, um, unequivocally, not, not negotiating it, 
and this is what we want, this is what we need, and and, and move forward, and then and then and then move forward on that. Uh, it's going to take people to really um, live up to their uh, Christian values, really live up to their moral values, really live up to those types of things, because this this practice of restorative justice, as I understand it, really comes from indigenous cultures primarily, where you know you have what was called the elders council, and I was going to tell the story, but that you, you know where where conflict was resolved in a way where even the whole idea of crime, let me just say that, you know, for example, I'm sure David is familiar with this as well. Even the whole idea of committing a crime is somewhat of a European concept, right? So what I say is that when someone breaks the trust in the community, right? Someone breaks the trust in the community, then the community has to come together to hold that person accountable. The person's family, the victim's family, the people, other people in the community all come together to hold that person accountable and to um, uplift the family that was vic that 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 um, was victimized, and and then out of that there is a resolution, there is a healing, there is a harmony that comes about, and there is um there the, and then also there's some tangible things usually that's asked of the person that that committed the violation as well that they must do to to support the family, uh, or to support the family of, of the victim or the, the victim itself, so that. So yeah, so I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, and that works. And there was a follow up about how does that relate to policy violations? And you know, David, you were just a student not so recently. And so how do you do, how do you implement that restorative justice? Yeah, and they are talking about the campus in terms of policy violations. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I think that's an interesting question and an interesting, um, I guess, action that the university can take knowing its history. Um, immediately, I, I thought to um, Germany and the role that schools are now playing in, in efforts to um, curb against anti-Semitism uh, um, and this kind of being a form of, of restorative and transitional justice. And I, I was, I remember speaking to people while I was there and they were saying how they may spend an entire semester studying um, or learning about the Holocaust and the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazi party and what that means. And, you know, how every student in Germany takes a trip to a concentration camp to just be there and, and relish in what happened in these places. I, I think that universities can play that same role, especially um, Swanee being placed in the South um, having these connections to um, a plethora of different states and having founders who have connections to a plethora of different states and have plantations in those areas, maybe taking some field trips, having these, maybe having courses, um, teaching about the, the real horror and the plunder of slavery and the plunder of, of, of Jim Crow and teaching what those um, crimes committed, how they created disparities in communities and kind of created the social fragments that we see on campus and off campus today. Um, I think that can be a real communal thing to, to not only affirm that you stand against your past generation of the Confederacy, but also take it to the student body and, and teach them these things that can possibly change the next generation. Yeah, thank you for that. And unfortunately, we are nearing our end time. And so I want to give you all just, a, you know, quick 30 seconds for any final thoughts you might have. And, um, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Register, but you've given us a lot of insights and a lot of um, food for thought. Yeah. So any final thoughts? Um, well, I I, I, sure. Well, I, I had mentioned earlier the United Nations um, forms of reparations, and I always bring this into any time I have opportunity to speak about reparations. So I'm, I'm going to do the, the quick, 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 quick version, though. So United Nations declares reparations in five forms. One is cessation and non-repetition, as we've made the point several times that these crimes against Black people continue even today, even as we have this conversation, right? We could look at so many different disparities in our community right now. Um, so cessation and non-repetition. Uh, restitution. Restitution looks at our legal standing of, looks at restoring people to the way they were before the crime uh, happened. We're talking about culture, we're talking about language, we're talking about citizenship, sovereignty, nationhood. Again, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to do it quickly because I, I usually try to unpack it a little bit more, but I'm not going to. So the next one is uh, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation looks at the, the cycle 
social trauma that people have gone through and how do we heal ourselves in terms of counseling, mental health, physical health, spiritual well-being, even our diets have changed. Our bodies were altered from the ship crossing, from spending the three months on the ship, our, 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 our phys physiology changed. So many different things have to be looked at and healed around our physical health, mental, social, spiritual health. Um, compensation. Um, we don't need to say a lot about that, but compensation is definitely a part of reparations, has to be a part of reparations. Um, and, and then the, the last one is satisfaction. I guess a lot, some of what we've been talking a lot about deals with satisfaction, which is restoring the dignity of a people. Some of what David was just talking about, people learning through memorials, through museums, through field trips, through education, through curriculum, the proper narrative of people's African descent um, sojourn to this country, not just the enslavement period, but also what we've contributed to the United States. You know, I was just sharing with people, I'll close out on this. You really can't tell the story of the United States. You really can't tell the story of the United States without telling the story of people, of Black people. And that's not just slavery. I'm talking about, even like, even if you talk about, for example, like the filibuster, like that was created because of slavery. And then, and then, and, and most effectively used to, to block civil rights legislation during the 60s, right? So if you look at almost any aspect of American history, science, technology, math, politics, economics, you can see that, it, that it's intimately tied, intimately woven to black history. And so that's, that's something that's important and I'll leave on that note, I'll close on that note. Yeah. Um, and just always say, uh, and also just say that, you know, if you would like to get more information uh, about Encobra, our website is encobraonline.org. That's N-C-O-B-R-A online.org. Uh, you can reach me uh, directly at reparationsj at gmail.com, reparationsj at gmail.com. And I'll, I'll put the uh, Encobra information in the chat. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Jim Oki. And I'm putting your email in the chat. And David, um, any final thoughts? Thank you, um, Woody and, and Nikki, for um, hosting us and, and the Robeson Project for putting this on. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, just, I guess final thoughts, um, like I said a little earlier, for the University of the South, just think about what that can mean um, today with your actions around reparations and, and around supporting this bill, HR 40, and making right on the wrong that was committed um, originally, um, not only by the university, but by the uh, United States government. And you have the opportunity to make the University of the South mean something different today, um, something that all people can come under a banner and feel welcome and, and feel entitled to because they played a part in building this region. And it can be a beautiful thing. It can be something that is not always associated with white supremacy or hatred or the lost cause. It has the possibility to be that shining light to inspire the United States and other countries across the world who may be reconciling with similar things. Um, so as the, as the beacon of the South that it was founded to be, um, it can transform with the activism by students, with the um, wonderful members of the Roberson Project, and with you know anyone on this call today, it, it has the potential to be whatever we put into it. Thank you, David. And I think you'll be happy to know that our new Vice Chancellor has you know a vision that aligns with a lot of what you've just said. Um, Dr. Register, um, any final closing out thoughts? Um, only that I should not have a last word. I'm more than happy for our, our two very generous alums and guests tonight to have the last word. Thank you both. Thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, we will put a video version of this uh, on the, um, on the Robertson Project Facebook page. So if you missed it or know of others who would like to see it, you'll have that opportunity. Thank you to my dear friend and colleague, Nikki Hamilton for doing this uh, today. She, yeah, excellent job. That, good night, everyone. And good night, everybody. We'll be hearing more from these guys. Yeah, thank you, Baba Jamoki. Thank you, David. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good stuff about you too, Dave. We had to chat some offline. I definitely, we definitely have to chat offline. Oh my gosh. Just, 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 oh, online. Online. Yeah. <laughs> He's online. Offline and online. I'll, I'll shoot you an email. Okay, um, great. <laughs>